Hey, and welcome to the latest video blog. This is number 20. Number 19, the previous one I did all about the Volkswagen Golf, has been a huge hit. Had Thomas Tetzlaff on from uh, Volkswagen Canada as we drove around in the new Volkswagen Golf Sport Wagon, the station wagon, in Austin, Texas in the pouring rain. Um, a lot of chances to talk about the product, what's coming up. Seem to get no end of interest in anything Volkswagen Golf. So watch that one. I do have a question about the, the Golf coming up in a second, but, but uh, watch that if you have any interest. Uh, now, a couple of things I want you to do as a favor to me, because I don't ask you really for anything, is whenever you get a video um, sent to you via YouTube or by Twitter, you can sign up at Driving with Zach for Twitter notifications, or go to Facebook, Motormouth Canada, to ask questions, and also you'll get that in your, uh, in your Facebook feed, is when you see one of my videos, two things you can do. Watch it fairly quickly upon its uh, publication. So when I send it out, watch it you know, as quickly as you can and also like it. Because what that does is it tells Google that my channel is a vibrant channel and it's worth checking out and it just places my videos higher for me and that, that really helps me out. Oh, by the way, I had a great time. I was away for 10 days in California with the kids and the family for spring break. We went to LA, it was super hot there. We went inland to Palm Springs into the Palm Desert and it is just so beautiful and dry and hot there. The temperature in Celsius was 32 to 34 degrees. It was just perfect for hanging out by the pool, drinking beer, drinking wine, it was great. All right, first one comes from James Chu. It says, hey Zach, I uh, love you watching your YouTube channel. I find it non-biased and very informative. Here we go with another golf question. Um, here's my question for you. I currently drive a 2012 uh, GTI five doors, my second GTI and my third golf. So a Volkswagen person. My wife and I are thinking of getting a new vehicle since our lease will be up in September. Our options include a new Mark 7 GTI or a Golf R or a GTD or an Audi A3 Sportback if it ever comes here or a Q3, which is a small uh, crossover or perhaps something more affordable like a Kia Forte 5 SX. We're thinking getting something that's got some port, some sport I should say, <clears throat> some power, high on looks which is subjective, versatility with a child and a little bit of cachet wouldn't hurt. Sorry for the long question, please advise James from Toronto. So what I didn't get James, I'll give you a thumbs down for this, is you didn't give your price range or what you want to spend. So obviously you have a GTI now and you're making payments on that so I'm assuming you can continue with that which would probably be a bit of a no-brainer. Take your uh, old uh, GTI back and just release a new one. And there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, it is bigger than the one you have now, has more backseat space, but for kids, it's always a concern. Now, you want something with cachet, and if you, if you live, I think he says he's in Toronto, um, then the all-wheel drive Golf R would definitely be something to consider. The GTD has not been announced yet for North America and Canada. The A3 Sportback has not been announced yet. And the Q3 is just a glorified Tiguan. So you're all right in there in the Volkswagen camp. If it was me, take your uh, GTI back, get a new one, get that relationship you know, continuing with your dealership and get the best possible deal that you can. And if you can spring for it, get the Golf R. Uh, Jerry McDonald says, what does class mean? As in best in class. I see this all the time in car reviews, but I don't understand it. Best in class means if you have, um, okay, we'll pick um, um, small cars. Okay, for example, you've got the Honda Civic, the Toyota Corolla, the Mazda 3, and, and a long, long list of other vehicles. So if, if people say the Volkswagen uh, Golf or the, um, the, the Mazda 3 has best uh, handling in its class or best in class handling means of all of those vehicles that are sold in that category of vehicle, it is the best in its class for handling or power or overall. And then the other thing you often hear is it's, uh, it's the, the benchmark, meaning this is the vehicle that all other companies in that class will benchmark themselves against, saying this is the leader. One example would be in the small compact, um, not compact, yeah, I guess small compact uh, luxury cars. The BMW 3 Series has long been considered the benchmark for handling. So all other car companies try to, a, a, a t all other car companies try to achieve that benchmark or try to better it. So that's really all it means. Best in class is you take a class of vehicles like small uh, compact or subcompact cars and is it the best in handling and power or is it the best in class overall? There you go. This one's a, going in the dumb bin. Archit 
Uh, Chabra says, which is the best car for under $15,000? Well, first of all, you didn't tell me if that's new or used. You didn't tell me what kind of car that you're looking for. So best car for under $15,000? Well, there aren't a lot of options really, because if you get a compact car like the Civics and the Corollas, sometimes you'll see a starting price at under $15,000, but the realistic thing is that you're not gonna get the car for that price. So what you're now doing is you're fishing in the subcompact cl class of vehicles, and and those would be the Hyundai Accents and the Kia Rios and maybe even that Mitsubishi Mirage or the new Micra. So what's the best car in, in well, I need more information. So don't just send me a, a, a saying, what's the best car for under 15,000? You want new, you want used, what size do you want? Get back to me. Jeanette McCoy says, Zach, with regards to the 2014 Ram 1500 with a 5.7 liter V8 Hemi, uh, does it have much worse highway fuel economy than the 3.6 liter V6 Pentastar? So what I did was I pulled out the numbers uh, for the 2015 fuel economy testing. Now, you have to keep in mind that we changed from 2014 to 2015 in the way that the fuel economy is calculated. We went from a city and a highway test to city, highway, cold start, air conditioning and high speed acceleration or hill climb. And the difference between the V8 is on the highway. Uh, the V8 gets 11.5 liters per 100 kilometers on the highway and the V6 gets 10.1. So just about one and a half liters more of fuel for every 100 kilometers driven and I'm using four by four pickup trucks. Just as a comparison, the V6 diesel, the eco diesel in the Ram, uses only eight liters per 100 kilometers on the highway. But get back to the V8 versus the V6. The V8 isn't going to be working that hard when you're driving it, but the V6 might be, depending on the load factors that you're gonna be using or passing on the highway. So if it's, if it's really between the V8 and the V6 and you're mostly concerned with highway driving, the V8 might be a better all-round choice because the V6 on paper might get better mileage, but in real-world conditions when that vehicle is tested, it might actually end up using more. Hey Zach, can you explain how a CVT works? Continuously variable transmission. All right, I'm gonna use a little bit of animation here from Nissan. This is a, an animation they made for the Ultima when it was released a couple years ago. What you conventionally have in a transmission are fixed gears. Now, Nissan and other manufacturers have gone to continuously variable transmissions, which basically have two, um, a pulley, basic, two pulleys basically, and either a belt or a chain driven system. And the pulleys change depending on the speed and they give you a much wider ratio of gears from very low to very high. So when you see this next animation as that's driving on the highway, sometimes the car is in between gears, maybe between third and fourth gear, or really what you need is like three and a half gears. And that's where a continuously variable transmission gives you just the right amount of power for this situation. Now we take it up to steady cruising on the highway. You with a CVT, because you have a wider ratio of gears, enables the engine to drop down to much lower RPMs and cruise along on the highway. And that in theory, lets the vehicle use less fuel. So that's why continuously variable transmissions have been adopted by companies like Subaru and others in more and more vehicles, and Nissan's been at it the longest, uh, because if it's optimized properly, you can get better fuel economy, and if it's optimized uh, properly and uh, programmed well and designed well, CVTs can be very, very effective. The early ones I hated, but some of the new ones are excellent. Some of the Nissan ones are very good. Some of the Subaru ones are very good, but some of the Nissan ones aren't good, and some of the Subaru ones aren't good. It depends on how it's calibrated, but hopefully that explains it to you. Uh, Ibrahim M. F. Zal says, what's your take on road salt in Canada? What's the best way to press rust proof a vehicle to ensure longevity, longevity of its drive? I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be motor melt today, it should be marble melt today. I've had experience with a 15 year old Toyota, runs like a champ, but issues uh, as it rusts, it's starting to get near the door sills and under the bottom of the car, which is eating away at exhaust, manifolds. I've never had rust control on a car, but now with newer vehicles, what's your take on proper rust control? 
Um, there's uh, electronic iodizing agents, dealer installed coatings when you purchase the vehicle, annual rust coating like Crown or Rust Check. What's your take on the environmental fallout on lighter color vehicles like getting specs on the paint? Um, what do you think as you go years down the road? Now I've had experience with this and I think that the best rust proofing system if you're going to buy a car and keep it long term is rust check and crown. That's the, the stuff they spray on the underside of the car and it basically pushes into all the nooks and crannies and it expels water. So salt on its own isn't going to hurt your car. It's salt and water that um, causes corrosion. So if you can expel the water that really helps quite a bit. Now, you can take it to one of their service areas, uh, that's Crown or Rust Check, or you can go to Canadian Tire and you can buy tins of this stuff and spray it on the inside of the wheel wells and the areas that a car is susceptible to rust, rust and do that you know, in the fall and through the winter time and make sure that this gets into all those nooks and crannies. It's not gonna get everywhere, but it's definitely gonna help. So get it professionally done if you want or get cans of it and do it yourself. The biggest thing you can do to prevent rust is to wash your car regularly. <clears throat> Go to one of those spray places and spray the inside of the wheel wells, wipe underneath the trunk lid, underneath the doors, clean that out. But doing a little spray with that rust uh, proofing, that um, rust check really, really does go a long way or have it done professionally. Nick Nicholas says, I've heard a couple of reviewer reviewers say that Toyota is gonna ax the Venza. And do you know anything about a RAV4 V6 soon? Okay, I have heard the same thing that the Venza is going to weigh, uh, the Matrix is going to weigh, but I would almost assume that they're going to have some new crossover vehicles in the mix. Um, so they've got the RAV4 just now, and the new trend, you see that with the, uh, the new Honda uh, HRV, is to go to a smaller crossover. So you can almost bet dollars to donuts that Toyota is going to follow that trend, get rid of the Matrix, and put in a smaller crossover vehicle. Same thing for the Venza. The Venza kind of falls somewhere between the RAV4 and the Highlander. So they might do another crossover in there. We're gonna have to wait and see. I don't think RAV4 is gonna come with a V6. They might put that turbo four cylinder that they've got in the NX. It's built on the same platform, that new Lexus NX. They might take the turbo four cylinder and drop that in. We're gonna have to wait and see. Uh, DC says, it says uh, Calden Mar 12, but DC says, Hey Zach, best uh, car for everyday pleasure, Buick Regal, Regal or Mazda 6? I'm torn between the two, please help. Well, this is kind of going on to what this other guy is going on about what's just the best car for under 15 grand. And I say this to everybody, if you're going to ask me a question, I need more information. You know, what do you use the car for? How old are you? Are you somebody that likes a sporty drive? Do you like a relaxed drive? Are you looking for performance? Are you looking for a quiet car? All of those kinds of things. I'll break down these two cars for you. The Buick Regal, except if you get the high performance one, is a very nice car to drive. It's quiet, it's comfortable, it's refined. It has um, many different engine choices. And actually, a Buick has one of the best quality scores of all brands, including imports, in the marketplace. So a lot of people don't know that. And that makes it a good buy. You start looking for a used Buick Regal. He's thinking of maybe getting 2014 models. If you're looking at a used one or one that's, you know, end of stock, you're going to get a good deal on a Buick Regal because they don't sell very many of them. Uh, but it's a very, very good car. Now, on the other hand, if you're wanting something that's got a little bit more um, driving dynamics, isn't as quiet, isn't as refined, the Mazda 6 is your car. It's, it's a little bit noisier. Um, it's got the new engine in there. It's a much more stylish looking vehicle, but it's not quiet and refined. It's more to somebody that likes somebody a little bit more passion behind the wheel. So you have to tell me what you are. I can't read minds here. That's a bit of a breakdown of those two vehicles. Don't overlook that Buick Regal. That's a damn good car. Well, that's all the time we have for this question and answer segment. Sorry, I'm a bit of a scatterbrain today. I've been on vacation for almost two weeks. Got to get back into the flow here. Once again, at Driving with Zach, follow along on Twitter. Make sure you like these videos and watch them as soon as you can. And also ask your questions over at uh, Facebook, Motormouth Canada. Talk to you later.